Attini diskussjoni tal-festival mediterranju tal-letteratura ta' Malta bit-tema Not Maintaining the Status Quo. Id-diskussjoni seti t-mexxa min John Portelli fu il-panel flimkin maġon għanna lil-Rasha Abbas mis-Sirja lil-Astrid Alban mir-Renju Unit u lil-Jolanda Pantin mil-Venezuela flimkin ma' l-interpretu ta'na Antoine Kassar. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you for the second discussion of our Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival. Today's theme is not maintaining the status quo and will be led by John Portelli. The other members of the panel are Rasha Abbas, Astrid Alben, and Yolanda Pantin, together with her interpreter, Antoine Kassar. John, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you very much. Um... Priscilla, sorry. <laughs> I'm 65, I have the right to forget. <laughs> all right, so um, good evening all and welcome to the session, the second session of discussions organized by, by, uh, by the festival. Um, I'm very glad to be here with um, colleagues, authors, and uh, I want to thank the organizers um, for all the hard work they do for this festival and for inviting me to um, moderate this session. So um, we had um, a bit of a conversation um, by email and then a bit on Sunday when they arrived and more again today. And um, we, we agree that this should be more of um, a, a genuine open discussion rather than a series of, of monologues. Um, so the, the um, way of proceeding will be as follows. I will give um, um, a minute or so for each of the author's um, guests to introduce themselves in whatever way they wish to do so. And then I will ask them to make an opening statement or remark or question, whatever, as, as an opening. And then um, we will try to have a bit of a conversation among ourselves regarding uh, the initial um, thoughts. And then I have six questions which I will go through. And um, again, they will briefly answer. And after each round, we will try to have a conversation among ourselves. Halfway through, more or less, uh, about 40 minutes, um, I am going to ask um, you, the audience, um, to, for about seven minutes, to raise any questions you may have, any comments, any remarks you may have, um, not with the aim that you will get um, a definitive answer from the people on the panel, but simply to get a sense of um, a feel for what the audience is thinking at the moment, given what uh, they have been hearing. And then the people on the panel, if they wish, they can comment, they can ask another question, and we will continue. And the aim is to end in an hour and a half. Okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's um, the, the structure. So um, did we agree who's going to start first? Yes, I think we agreed um, that Russia will introduce her first. Yes? You want the game, so you go last or first? Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Rasha Abbas. Uh, I was born in Syria, 1984. And I really hope you forget this information when my age starts to be a problem for me. And uh, I was born in Latakia, in Syria, and spent uh, 28 of my life in Damascus. And uh, then I moved to Lebanon and then to Germany. Uh, basically, I, uh, I write short stories. I've published three collections. Uh, first in 2008, it was called Adam Hates Television. Is my voice clear? Yeah. Okay. 
and uh, then I uh, wrote a humorous uh, book in Germany called How German Grammar Was Invented. No, I don't know how to speak German, but it was just a comedy book. And uh, also, uh, I then wrote a not comedy, a depression book. It was called The Gist of It. It just came out this year. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Rasha. Thank you. Astrid, you're going next? OK, Astrid. Yes, so my name is Astrid Alban. I'm a poet, and I'm a translator. And I translate from the Dutch and Flemish because before I moved to the UK at a very young age, I was born in the Netherlands and grew up pretty much bilingual. And growing up bilingual meant that I, in some ways, grew up on the outside of many things and carry that um, kind of feeling that I'm sure many of you will recognize of the desire to belong and the fear of what happens when you do belong. And I call it kind of my state of unbelonging. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Yolanda? Sí, uh, buen, buenas noches. Eh, mi nombre es Yolanda Pantin. Eh, nací en Caracas en el año 54. Eh, pero crecí en un pueblo cercano a la ciudad, pero pueblo al fin, en un, en un ambiente agrario. Eh, estudié literatura en Venezuela, en Caracas. Eh, tengo 13 libros publicados de poesía. Solamente he publicado poesía, aunque también libros para niños y una pieza de teatro. Y ese li el, mi primer libro lo publiqué en el año 1981 y el último en el año 2017. Eh, el conjunto del trabajo reúne una, cier una cierta cantidad de páginas y hacen un recorrido de vida, que es un recorrido literario que termina siendo el testimonio de una persona venezolana. Eso sería. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh, Antoine? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, Yolanda was born in Caracas in 1954. Not actually in Caracas, but uh, uh, a nearby rural town. She studied literature in Caracas. She's published 13 books of poetry. But she also publishes books for children and writes theatre scripts. And from she began publishing in 1981, and her latest book came out in 2017. And recently in Spain, um, her collected works, 700 pages, um, were published by um, a well-known publisher called Pretextos. Thank you, Antoine. So let me um, read the statement that was prepared by the organizers as a focus for this uh, conversation. It reads as follows. Society embraces, uses, and practices while prohibiting others. At times, literature and the rest of the art scene mirror this status quo. At other times, they question it. Do artists shoot at the wrong taboos or only shoot at ones that are safe to shoot at? Locally, is it too facile to criticize the environment situation? Is it at the expense of other issues, such as nepotism, abortion, fiscal corruption, and the threat of the far right? Are artists too weary of biting the back hand that feeds them? That's the statement prepared by, by the organizers. I have three introductory remarks um, to make. Um, whether we agree or not 
that artists should maintain or not maintain the status quo. The fact of the matter is that the issue is an old one, okay? Um, but for me, it is still relevant uh, to us uh, today. Very old, um, simply a quick reminder, in Plato's Republic, Plato critiques the poets for, um, for corrupting the youth. Um, Dante, for example, states the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of great moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Obviously, he's making the claim that uh, as a writer, he should pronounce his views. And more recently, authors like Salman Rushdie, Ahmed Naji, an Egyptian, Tahar Ben Jaloun, the Moroccan, Asli Erdogan in Turkey, Darin Tatur in Palestine, all authors who have dealt with controversial contemporary issues and within quotes, got into trouble, whatever, whatever that means. I think we also have cases from our local scene um, throughout the 19th and 20th century as well. Um, that's my first point. The second point is the notion of status quo is um, in a way evasive. Um, it, it does not exist in and of itself. It is only a relational term. Um, what may be the case in Malta may not be the case in Venezuela, may not be the case in Syria or Germany or Holland or the UK or, or wherever. So it varies with time and it varies with context. Um, it is varied and not monolithic. My third and final point is that um, although we tend to critique the status quo, I think, and maybe this is my background in philosophy, we need to stop and say, what is the nature of the status quo? Because there may be um, things that are happening within the current situation that may indeed be just. Of course, if they are not just, then it seems to me we need to raise um, them as an issue. And, and, and then, when we raise the issue, it may be deemed to be controversial. But even controversial uh, is not monolithic. Uh, and I think we need to distinguish between an, a, a popular controversy and a genuine controversial issue that indeed has different alternative views and different reasons for it. So those are my generic introductory remarks. Um, I teach in the Department of Social Justice Education. And my view in general is that we need to question and challenge the status quo. But we will see what the members of the panel um, think on this matter. So, Astrid, go ahead. Thank you. OK. Um, when the World Trade Center um, th um, event happened when the planes flew into World Trade Center. At that time, I was at the, as a poet at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam, um, working together with artists and scientists. And I was in a bar with a um, Italian artist and the planes were flying into the building. And she looked at me and she said in her thick Italian accent, oh fuck we're going to have to talk about religion again. <laughs> so um, I was also working on my first poetry collection at the time, and preoccupied with very different um, matters. And one of my guiding um, kind of lights in this is the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. And she speaks of correspondences in the air. And she speaks with correspondences in the air. What she's referring to is how poets and writers across geographical and historical boundaries and time spans, how they transverse and communicate with each other through their cultural heritage, their differences, and certainly when I write, my status quo is the people I speak with. They are the poets, the writers. 
in the same way that if you are a physicist, your status quo is to be understanding of certain um, mathematical um, axioms and um, same with astrophysicists. Um, one of the poets here this week, Renna, I don't know if she's here this evening, but she's a, um, a biochemist and I'm, I'm, I'm sure she would, I'm speaking for her now, but I think she'd agree that we have our own status quo. And I think through that, and I think that is why it's so great being here, to have kind of a gathering of people who are trying to speak across the status quo with each other. I think we then challenge it, but I don't think necessarily, I speak for myself now, I set out to challenge any status quo in my work as a poet. I go out on the street, I protest, I was a squatter, um, I um, definitely have political opinions, but I do not feel any responsibility to put that political activism in my work um, because I am busy with listening to the correspondences in the air. But having said that, I have a civic duty um, where there is a crossover as a poet and as a citizen where the two do meet. It's an awkward area um, in that it's, it's no longer about what is good poetry, but... Um, um, and then there's one, can I find, f quote, an American poet, Frank Bidar, who says that um, what artists do is we fill in forms that have been, that, that have been left for us. And in filling those forms with our artwork, we challenge and change others. And also we challenge and change ourselves. And I certainly would relate to that. And that's it. Thank you, Astrid. That's an opening statement. Thank you. All right. So, um, Rasha or Yolanta? Yolanta, thank you. Bueno, ahora sí vamos a, a ir despacio. El tema de la, del statement tal como está planteado me resultó sumamente confuso por la siguiente razón. Yo vivo en Caracas eh, y he vivido todos estos años y estoy viviendo una revolución. Una revolución que ha conmovido a la sociedad venezolana enteramente, la ha atravesado. En un contexto tan politizado y tan difícil de llevar, estés del lado de donde estés, es muy difícil sustraerse del mismo, del mismo conflicto creado, del conflicto político. De manera que todas estas preguntas que son fascinantes, yo las veo muy lejanas y, está, y, y están, esas preguntas están sofocadas por la emergencia cotidiana. Continúo. Yolanda says that she found um, the, the, the question, the title of this discussion confusing because um, she's lived all her life in and around Caracas and now uh, she is living a revolution, a revolution that has moved people, shifted people, split people. And she says that whatever side you're on, um, it's impossible to evade politics in Venezuela, even when it's not present. And um, other Im important themes have become suffocated by the revolution and everything around it. Es muy importante que apuntes que ese, digamos, esa, el peso del Estado con su carga Hace que lo, nos hace a los ciudadanos absolutamente 
dependientes de las mínimas cosas, de manera que es casi muy difícil pensar. It's very difficult to think for us. But yo puedo escribir poesía. I can write poetry. Because I protect my poetry. Porque el alma está en la poesía. Well, I can fill in the blanks. Okay. So. <laughs> ah, okay. So Yolanda says that we, we need to take note you know, and be aware of the fact that in Venezuela, the, 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 the sheer weight of the, of the state um, makes citizens dependent on the tiniest things. Um, Antoine. And then you continue the yes. English. Okay. Uh, eh, no. Siendo que le... Yeah, I, I think to say we, we can unpack this more as we as we proceed. But if, if you have another quick statement, I will allow you to make it. Okay, okay, perfecto. Gracias. Okay, good. I didn't mean to silence you, but we, we will come to it again. Um, Russia. Uh, okay, so for me, uh, to, when I was asked to make a statement about this introduction. I would not say also it was kind of confusing, but for me it's stressful for, for, for a reason that the questions we are trying to answer here are uh, related to an even more uh, like question we cannot be sure of, or at least I cannot be sure of, which is why do we write? This question with, which I've heard like a difficult, uh, very different answer with each writer answered this question. Should we write to change the system? Should we like stick to this responsibility? Or uh, as uh, we will discuss later, or it will like this uh, direct like relation between what is political and being a political activist also, like she said, became like an obstacle or became a burden to what literature is in itself. So for, an, uh, for a question like this, I uh, honestly don't have a certain answer. Uh, and especially, I might allow myself to say especially after uh, experiencing what happened in Syria uh, during the Syrian uh, uprising, uh, which we found that words actually did not save anyone. Words did not make a change. It did not save people from being killed. It did not do anything. So uh, I uh, started to, to feel like literature as a medium has more of a reflecting nature then it is in itself a direct resisting tool. Now this is, you can change my mind or, sure. yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you, Rasha, thank you to all. So let me, let me push you a bit and, um, and then you can, you can comment also among uh, yourselves. Um, I, I have two, two questions that came to mind and I ask these in an open-ended way, okay? Um, so, with regard to your point, Astrid, um, if I get it right, you seem to distinguish between yourself as a writer and yourself as a citizen. Am I correct here? Or... And, 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 of course, my follow-up question is, do you manage to do that, if that is the case? No, no, no. I okay. don't. But I, um, but I don't let, necessarily let what's going happening what is the i don't let the headlines influence okay. my own um processes as, as an artist as a I as a poet i understand okay good um and and of course um yolanta and uh rasha you can comment as well if you wish on on this okay the other question i had was um um um, with regard to your point, uh, Russia, what is, um, why do we write, okay? May I ask you, why do you write? 
I wish really I have an answer. You don't have this. an answer. No, but one time I was in um, one of the, the novels, I read something I can relate to, mm -hmm. which is like we write so we don't drive ourselves crazy. Yes, okay. So in my yeah. case, I'm not sure it's working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will figure out with years. So it's, but I, I feel more related to this kind of, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Yolanta, I don't know whether you have any comments on either of these questions or anything that, uh, you know, our, our friends have, have mentioned also. Ah, no, in este momento no. 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 That's very clear. Astrid and uh, Rasha, do you have anything else to comment on what either of you have said? May I ask another one? I'm very curious. Um, um, so, are you saying, Astrid, that in your writing you try to be neutral? I know this may be a difficult. And you, you can say buzz off, John, all right? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't mean to say that I'm, I'm neutral in any way. I don't think trying to think what you mean by neutral. I don't know if I know what that is. In other words, you're not taking any stand at all. Stand on what? On what you may be writing. I'm writing a poem. Yes, I understand. So is the poem neutral or, or, or is it, or is it, or is it, um, or is it challenging something like your activism may be challenging something. Let me put it this way. Do you consider your writing as another form of activism? I uh, don't consider my writing like that. I think that is for the reader to consider. It's for the what? The reader to consider. Ah, okay. I can say that at the moment, what my work is about is that one of my earliest memories is when I was around six or seven years old. So my earliest memory is quite a late memory. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, I decided I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I remember telling my dad, who was wearing his corduroy trousers and kind of crouching down because he knew I was making an important point. And I said, Dad, I know what I want to be. I want to be a boy. Okay. And he said, oh, Astrid, you know, you can't choose. You are born either a girl or a boy. And so I was born in the 70s. So, and I am, so I um, was devastated by the answer. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing that will probably dictate the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. I was not in control of this. And I had no, not the words for it. I couldn't articulate it. I was quickly distracted by other things, like the hedge. I remember going through the hedge with my hand maybe as a movement of consolation, I don't know, but this boy I never got to be grew up alongside of me and is my alter ego. And he is in some of my earlier poems and called B because I, clearly not that original with names, <laughs> and um, still not very much more original with names, he has popped up in my new work as poet now, it so happens that we are living in a time, but we are, I think, in every time living in a time where we have to think about our sex and how we mm -hmm. empower ourselves. But I didn't choose this topic, and it just so happens that whatever topic you choose, if you're human, it will connect. Okay. Thank you. Um, with regard to Yolanta and uh, Russia, I know I have read some of, of your work, which is influenced partly by your um, context in, in life in Damascus, okay? And Yolanda, you have made the statement that, of course, um, you, um, you, 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 you are living a revolution and this, it is impossible to evade politics in, in the context of, of, of Venezuela. So, with regard to the question that I ask Astrid, do you see the world in the same way, or, or, or do you find that your work is more politicized in terms of, of challenging the status quo or not? 
either of you. No lo puedo pensar y no puedo improvisar porque no, no entiendo el, el idioma. Pierdo los matices de lo que, de lo que Astrid está diciendo. Pero respecto a la pregunta tuya, está, a lo largo de, de estos 20 años de revolución, teniéndola presente, estando muy cerca de ella, como ciudadana me refiero, yo he hecho un esfuerzo enorme por impedir que la toque, que toque mi poesía. ¿Qué dice? Para impedir que la política toque mi poesía, porque si no sería un panfleto político. ¿No? Eh, la poesía no puede, no puede ser panfletaria porque entonces estaríamos hablando de otra cosa. Yo tengo que cuidarla, hay que cuidar, cuidar las palabras, cuidar el alma que está allí en esas palabras. No puedo, no puedo permitir que nada la toque, aunque la toque cotidianamente. So Yolanda says that um, throughout the 20 years of revolution, as a citizen and as a writer, um, she has made a huge effort not to let the, the political situation influence her work in such a, a way that her work ends up being not propagandist, but um, she, she wants to avoid slipping into pamphlet writing, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yo tengo una respuesta política, en un sentido humano, de, como ciudadana, una respuesta política a, a, a lo que está pasando en Venezuela y a lo, que está pasando, a lo que nos está pasando a todos en el mundo. El libro que reúne toda mi poesía se llama País. Esa es mi respuesta. Pero, um, Yolanda dice, su respuesta política to um, the events of Venezuela is, it can be uh, read in um, her collected works. The title of her collected works is Pais Country. Okay, thank you. And also she said at the beginning, and I forgot to say that, to, to read that book is to read the testimony of a person from Venezuela. All right. Thanks. Astrid, you want to? No, no that, that, that sounds, I, I, I can relate that, that was very beautiful what you said that to read your collected works is to read what it is like 20 years of living in Caracas I think that's really beautifully said yeah. thank you thank you Yolanda um, Russia uh, for me uh, first as a short answer no I would not describe my work as political but <laughs> I kind of uh, like relate to what George Or Orwell said once, that there is no such a thing as non-political okay. art or literature. This right. can be done, even if you don't have the intention to do it, which mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, but uh, there is something we cannot escape. Okay. It's part of our daily lives, okay. especially like uh, you are talking to a woman that was raised in the Middle East. We have violence. We have like uh, our political struggle, we have oppression, we have also sexism, whatever you want. It is part of our daily life. So mm -hmm. even if I try to like uh, write the weirdest science fiction ever, it will appear there. You will mm -hmm. see it in mm -hmm. the background. So it's uh, kind of this uh, presence of the absence thing. It's even if you can see the traces, even if it's not there, I don't intend to do it. But you, you can see it. Good. So uh, there seems to be a, a theme developing here that the intent is one thing, and what emerges and what people read in your mm -hmm. work is, is something else. And you leave that to the reader, and it's up to them. Um, le le let me move to a question, one of the questions that I had sent you. Now that we have this context of 
some of the thinking of the authors and the context in which they work. One of the questions was, what do you consider to be some major controversial issues um, in the context in which uh, you live at the moment? Yeah. Well, I, I answered that a little bit. And I, I came from Syria, so my whole country is a controversial issue itself. So yes. It's, yeah. But at the moment, you live in Germany. I live in Germany, right, right, I live in Germany, but it's still like the topic which I'm concerned about, it's uh, pretty much rela related to what's happening in Syria and all. And even, even uh, when you are speaking about living in Germany, uh, it's about uh, in, in, like in this wave and in our situation what it is like for a Syrian living in Germany. So it, it's, still, it's still related. Okay, all right, thank you. What, it, yeah, what, it, what is it like living as a Syrian in Germany or in Berlin? It's Thank you. Nice. The basically, it is it's nice. It's nice living in nice. Germany. But I mean, uh, do we have any Germans here? <laughs> Are you about to make a controversial claim? Sorry. No, I will not make a racist joke, don't worry. Yeah, so, <laughs> so was that. <laughs> no, but I'm speaking because, you know, I'm not one of the, those people. I wish I was like one of those people who, for example, like had a dream to study abroad. They followed their dream. They chose a country. I did not go this way. I went there because I had to. Because uh, because there was th th this was this problem. I have to flee my country. It was not a regular situation, so that's why I mean uh, like about situation of a Syrian nowadays living in Germany. Thank you, Astrid. Do you want to follow up or uh, Yolanda? Yes, please, please, please. No, eh, quiero responder la pregunta. Y la voy a leer, es corta, la respuesta, the answer to your question. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. Okay. <clears throat> Antoine translated into the English. <laughs> <laughs> claro. <laughs> El tema controversial en mi país ahora y desde hace 20 años desde que Hugo Chávez llegó a la presidencia de la República en 1998, es la política. Esto es inédito para nosotros. Me estoy refiriendo a los poetas. La política ha permeado nuestras vidas. Es imposible sustraerse en ella, estés en el lugar donde estés, de este lado o del otro, toca nuestras vidas. Lo primero, se ha producido una herida al separarnos en dos pedazos, los que acompañan y apoyan al gobierno y los que lo adversan. De cualquier manera, los venezolanos hemos sido estremecidos y quiero decir que el sufrimiento que causa la contienda política, la herida política, es imposible de comunicar, es intransferible. Cada persona sabe lo que lleva. Me alarma constatar que es la primera vez que viajo con un documento que me sostiene delante de ustedes y es el informe que produjo la oficina de la Alta Comisionada de los Derechos Humanos de la ONU, Michelle Bachelet, que pongo a disposición de quien se interese por el tema. Ever since... <coughs> Hugo Chavez became uh, president of the Republic in 1998. The main controversial issue in Venezuela has been and remains politics. This was unprecedented. Politics has permeated our lives, even as poets. It's impossible to get away from it wherever you are, whichever side you're on. Firstly and foremostly, um, politics has split us into two, those who accompany and support the government and those who oppose it. As Venezuelans, we've been shaken, and I want to make it clear, Yolanda wants to make it clear, that uh, the, the, the pain, the wound inflicted by the battles of politics, it's it, the suffering, oh yeah, is impossible to communicate. It's not transferable from one person to another. 
and each and every person knows the individual particular pain that they carry. Alarmingly, for the first time, Yolanda has traveled with a particular document in order to back her up as she sits here in front of you. So she has brought a report on human rights in Venezuela written by the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the UN, Michelle Bachelet. And if anyone would like to see this report, she can make it available at the end. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rasha and Astrid, any comments if you have or questions for um, I would very much. For I, I'm very brave of you to bring this report with you. I'm quite moved, actually, you. by your act, and I would love to read a report of it. Yeah. Thank you. We can, we can have it afterwards. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, let me move on to... I brought a list of what's yes. going on in my yes. country. Yes, I was going to... Let's move on to the list. I wasn't, sorry. Thank you, Astrid. Yes, yes. Go ahead. The people I want to kill. No, the... So... Um, <laughs> I told them they can interrupt me at any time. So, this is normal in Malta. Sorry, so, um, a couple of things. So, obviously, on my list is Brexit. Um, I um, came to England at a um, very young age, also like Rashna, but different circumstances. I did not choose to come to England. I, I came with my parents, and I um, tried to integrate, the word is called now, I did not know this, um, and adapt, and um, I think managed to do that, um, and believed until a few years ago that I had been accepted, that I was a hybrid, that part of me was English. It's my mother tongue, it's the language I think in, fuck in, write in, my driving license, you name it, I've done it in English. And um, I am now being told that in fact I do not belong, I should have a little bag packed waiting for me at the front door. I don't know if I'm going to get my marching orders, I'm not quite sure when I'm going to get my marching orders. And. Um, it, yes, so that is, that is the state at the moment in England. There is, I think, underneath Brexit is a bigger problem than what I am going to pack, and that is the problem of inequality. And uh, it is ripping the country apart. I have one more thing on my list, which is, in this story is, for me, as an artist, is where is the avant-garde? So where can I find, so it's, yeah, that's maybe a separate issue. Maybe I'll, that's too much on my list maybe, but that's, um, somehow I think that's connected, but I'm not quite sure how it is connected. Oh, am I? Yes, um, I said, although we are close, it was echoing and I didn't hear the last two sentences that you... Did people Sorry. hear what I had to say about Brexit? Yeah, that one, yes. Okay. Yes, it's the last sentence. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and maybe I'm the only one because I'm... and they can hear better. I think in that, what I'm trying to find is where is the avant-garde? Where is my escape? Okay, now I understand. I guess. Yes. You, you can elaborate a bit more if you wish. Yes. I'm not sure if I if can you want right to. now. No, okay. no, I, if I could, I would, but I... I, I th Fair enough. Thank you. Yolanda, you want to come in? Yes, because... Um, ah, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> no, no. I don't speak English, no. Es interesante lo que dice Astrid acerca de la vanguardia poética porque yo he descubierto en mi caso que la única vanguardia posible está into the self, la vanguardia. 
eh, es un momento, así lo percibo, de, de, retro, de, resguardo, de resguardo y de profunda introspección. Es la única vanguardia que, que, que es posible, porque lo demás es absolutamente pretencioso. Eso es lo que quiero mm. decir. Oh, this is strong. Okay. If I understood it well, yes. Antoine, yes. Did everyone understand? No. Yeah, go ahead. No, She's saying that um, if you want to look for the poetic avant-garde, then you have to look yes. look into yourself. You need in introspection, because if if uh, maybe in the case of. Uh, British poetry or Venezuelan poetry, if you look for it, then you're going to be disappointed. Yes? Ah, But, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, Yo ahead. pienso que si, que la única vanguardia posible, en la, estoy hablando de poesía, es el grito. Es gritar sin palabra. Y eso no se puede escribir. So Yolanda is now saying that um, the only possible Uh, poetic avant-garde is to scream, but without words, and that's something. To scream that, without, without words, or to shout without words, and, and it's okay. and it's very yeah. difficult to do. Astrid, yes. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, deafening silence. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, Delving into oneself, I, I am hearing, uh, and I will get you in, in a second, uh, Russia, I haven't forgotten you, that, that um, and here I'm reflecting on my own experience as well, as someone who was raised in Malta and has, for the last 42 years, been living in Canada. Yesterday was my anniversary, 42 years in Canada, whatever that is. And I still don't feel connected to the land. And, and this brings me to then, I mean, if you have to look into yourself, I hear a subtext in what you're saying, that the Brexit, Brexit issue is now raising questions about issues of identity, possibly, or, or even safety. Am I reading too much? No, I think that's a fair statement. Right. Now, of course, in the case of uh, Russia, I mean, she was brought up in, in Syria and then moved, and does this connect to you, or, or do you feel whole and... Uh... Uh, to be honest, when I moved out of Syria, it was not the first time when I felt really not belonging, mm -hmm. because I had this feeling even when I was in my own country, because sometimes you cannot belong even to what's around yeah. you, like yeah. even like... To, uh, because, for example, I would uh, recall a funny phrase my mom would, uh, used to say about me when she is mad. Uh, she would say that I'm a satanic plant because... <laughs> it, but it sounded cool, actually, I like it. Because it's cool, right? Right, a oh. satanic plant. Yeah, so see, she, she said, because you just act like you don't have roots. Yes. So what's wrong with you? You okay. don't. Are you a satanic plant? You know this kind yes, of yes, plant yes. that they have. Yeah, don't. Do, yeah. Yes, yeah. So it's I. It's a good title for a book. Yeah, it's actually. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will give you credit for this. Sorry. Yeah. No, you said it. Okay. So. <laughs> so in that sense, even in Damascus, sometimes I feel like I feel I'm not. Really, I, I'm a kind of an outcasted somehow. Okay. So, but actually, when I arrived to Berlin, uh, in that perspective, exactly, it's actually the first time I saw a lot of people who are like me, who are also like not belonging. So it's turned into belonging to the not belonging, and so uh, yeah. So this feeling was not really new for me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I will, I'm going to ask the audience in a minute for any comments they may have, questions, and please try to ask them in an open way, not to any particular author, so that we get a sense of the audience. But so that the, the uh, Antoine, was there something that? No, no, I, I think that if there is a question for a particular person. Yeah, they can mention it as well, but they don't have to be compelled that, okay, fair enough, agreed. Um, my next set of questions to the author, so that they can think about it, is now, given what you have said about maintaining status quo, challenging, 
politics, controversial issues, and so on. Um, some of the people in the audience may have read some of your work, others not. Would you be kind enough, not now, after we're here, um, what are some of the issues of this kind that have arisen in your work? Okay? All right. The audience. Uh, we need microphones, perhaps. Is there a roving mic? Yes, thank you. Yes, and, and if there is a, per, a particular question to one of the authors, please do raise it. Okay, thank you. All right. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, there are two comments, one on politics and one on belonging and uh, being connected to land. And uh, on politics, when I was listening to the, the authors, uh, what they were saying, it seemed like politics is something existing outside of them, something noisy, disturbing, something um, not so inspiring, something they want to escape. But Politics, if we think about it, it's relation, relations that we have with one another. So if there are more than two people in a room, we have politics. We have politics here, definitely. Yeah, so, so the way we relate to one another, we'll have interest, we'll try to negotiate something, have a clear goal, we'll have to uh, come up with a plan, agree, disagree, fight, I don't know, have a revolution, default, <laughs> you name it. So politics, in a way, I mean, it's quite a luxury to think that you may avoid politics, and it's a, it's a very middle class idea that, you know, like, uh, like Anna Akhmatova uh, had, you know, I, that's, 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 I am above this all, it's for plebs, etc. And, um, and regarding being connected to land, I mean, why do we need to be connected to land? We are not plants. I mean, gypsies and Jews were persecuted specifically because they were considered not being connected to land. It's such a conservative idea. Idea that there is a place for everyone and everyone belongs to their place. I think we should do away with that idea altogether, especially here in, you know, in, in the space supposedly you know, where people think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Don't you want to respond to that? I, I, I wouldn't mind responding uh, uh, to that. You, you I think it's a really good point what you're okay. making. Ask, ask. I go think go what go. we're saying is not so much that politics is not something. I speak for myself. It's not that I'm not concerned about politics. It's just that if the work is political, whatever you do, in the context in which you present it, and by the people who read it. So if I want to write a political statement, I write an essay and I publish it in a newspaper, which I have done on Brexit, for instance. But if I want to work as an artist, it doesn't matter what I write. As long as it's good, it will be political. So that is, I think, if that did not come across, then thank you for bringing that up. But that's the point I think I was trying to make. Thank you. Good, good. If you want to comment, you can. Ella tiene razón. Por supuesto que tiene razón. Estamos haciendo en este momento política. La política es la que hace que, la, que las personas se entiendan, que hayan acuerdos, discusiones, se hagan los proyectos, se conduzca un país. Pero cuando yo hablo de política, hablo de otra cosa. Hablo, hablo de imposición de una línea política. Y eso es importante saberlo. No, yo estoy de acuerdo con ella. Lo que hay que entender es que cuando yo hablo de política, en mi país hablo de la imposición de una línea política sin acuerdos y sin posibilidad de discusión. Yeah, Yolanda says that you're totally right that um, politics is, is, it's about human relationships, it's about how one agrees, how one disagrees, and how one governs a country. Um, but then it's a completely different kettle of fish, she says, she says, when 
you have uh, the imposition of a single monolithic uh, politics in a country. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Adrian. Yeah. Um, thank you for your interventions. They were lovely, very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, of course, literature inhabits words, um, and literature is about words. So I, I fully agree with all you've been saying about how literature is essentially about what you do with words. That's what makes literature. Um, but I have two quick questions, sort of. Would you consider the possibility that there is not one kind of poetry within the same poet, I mean, but different kinds of poetry. So you can be a social activist and read a poem that speaks to a particular moment, and, and it would be a poem. It wouldn't be the kind of poem many of us would probably agree would be a publishable poem in an anthology, but it's also first point. Would you consider the possibility that there are actually different kinds of poetry, or other different poetries? Second point. Would you consider also, um, rather than the need, which I understand perfectly and agree with perfectly, of making sure that poetry is essentially about words, would you also consider the issue of the need to deal with political issues um, through poetry. I'm talking about a need, a personal, very deep personal need. So I would imagine this is something for, for all, that if you wish. The poets. Sorry? Asterix. Yeah, absolutely, because, be very eager. Go ahead, go ahead. because that is what happens. But it's not because I feel it's my responsibility and my civic duty to do so. I think that's the point. I'd write that because I think it needs to be written by me, from me. It's my response, it's my... So it's not because... But I probably, if somebody asked me, could you quickly put something together for this and, or that demonstration, I'd also do it. So it's not... Yeah, so I, yes, 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 I would answer you that way, yes. Can, can I ask a question? Can I ask Go ahead, Antoine, please. Because I had something that you well, asked. Well, right, let, let, let's continue. Let, I, I will come to the panel, but let's hear from, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. because I think this relates to what Adrian has just asked, and it was pretty much what I wanted to ask, but I wanted to just, um, bring out something that I think is related to this topic of different kinds of poet, poetries existing within a poet and the need to put a poem perhaps not in an anthology but in the moment from which that poem came and there is this uh, Bengali poet Joy Goswami who, who is a very fine poet and at one point when I was uh, talking to him about his work he did say uh, that uh, when you are stabbed the voice that comes out of you is different from the from when you are kissed so when you're stabbed, that is the moment when your voice, the voice that emerges, is like you were saying, it could be a scream without words. And he says, that is the moment which impels me to write protest poetry. And he says, it is, it is a different kind of poetry. It is polemical, it is protest. I make a little pamphlet, I give it out. And I've never forgotten that. So I wonder whether this is something that you relate to as writers, not just as poets, that the nature of your voice changes when there's something that pushes you, that stabs you, that punches you. Yeah, actually, I really relate with this because, and uh, usually you are the last one to be able to chase the changes in your own literature. It's like losing weight. You are really the last one to, to see it, to be able to see how you change. But sometimes when I go uh, back through the text and I see the ones, for example, I wrote in Damascus, uh, for example, a period which is Damascus 2008, and then Damascus 2011 and 12, 
with all what's happening. And then when we reach, like for example, when I'm in a safe space, like which is Germany, and uh, lots of things change. So of course, it's a total different thing. I saw how how much the like the uh, the past uh, text, uh, like they were more fast, more intense. Uh, they were, uh, and then how it changed, even the tone. Like it was then more calm. It was, and uh, actually, if I went to. Uh, go so far with this. I really don't uh, like uh, supporting like ideas and cliches saying like it's only with sorrow that you be creative. But actually, I felt I lost a lot when I reached a safe zone. I I felt it. I felt like I'm not writing with the same passion. I like I used to do. It, it's not the same. It's something else. In, in my own opinion, I, I felt like when I was in this situation of discomfort, I felt I was writing better. Uh, thank you very much. Um, all around us, all around us, uh, the elephants are fighting, and things seem to be falling apart. So, as writers, what gives you hope for the future? Let's keep this. Disculpa, Eric, y discúlpenme todos, pero en este momento yo no tengo ninguna esperanza. She, she, so she asks for, she, yeah, for forgiveness, please excuse me. She apologizes, thank you. Uh, but right now she sees no hope whatsoever. En el sentido de la de cómo la, digamos, el mundo está siendo conducido naturalmente, porque hay una, una corriente natural que va hacia la destrucción. Y cuando hablo de destrucción, hablo de la destrucción de la tierra. Y eso cualquiera lo puede saber y cualquiera lo puede ver. Hay agua en Malta, por ejemplo. What happened with the water in Malta? Water. Uh, she said that, so the way things are going, nature itself is uh, on a, a very quick downhill slope, like what's happening with the, the situation of water in, um, well, all over the place, but especially, I think, Latin America. Thank you. And Malta, she said. Antoine, is there something you need to clarify, or should I move on? Sorry, I'm giving you. Uh, I had a question for yes, yeah, there is your question, and there is another fellow here. And then I'm going to go back to the question I asked the three authors to think about, and there may be another follow-up. And then I will give another few minutes to the audience, and then we'll end, OK? We promised we end before midnight. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> Antoine, go ahead. Antoine and... Uh, I don't know your name, sorry. Okay, yeah, so, uh, a question for Astrid, right? So in your book that's coming out now, Plain Speak, there's this dialogue between uh, let's, so your alter ego, the inner boy or inner man, and very generally speaking, let's say the outer female, right? How would you feel if a publisher or a reviewer or a festival organizer or whatever, framed yeah. plain speak as a book of poetry that talks about gender issues and gender politics. Would it be too reductive? Yes, I think it would be too reductive. Um, 
but I'd, it'd be too reductive. I also just wanted to say to Eric that this thing, this, you know, what gives, you ho what gives hope? And I think it's, it is a really tough, difficult question. I think little acts of kindness and bravery, I think, and humor. And this gives me a little bit of time to think about this question about being pigeonholed. No, I, I really would not feel uncomfortable with it because um, that's not really my intention. That's not what drove me to write these poems. I was interested in other things in it, within it. Which, so if you label this book as a book about gender and sex, what you miss is that it's also a book about structure and syntax. And syntax is what makes us communicate, is what makes people understand each other. So at a deeper level, I would say it's probably more political in the way that it is about comprehension or about communication or I'm, I'm not saying that that's what it is about but you exclude you know by labeling it one thing you 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 take away its possibilities thanks for asking that question thank you Astrid. Um. Uh, so this evening we've uh, we've We've covered the sense of belonging. We've also covered, uh, you know, status quo and um, and how the written work is is political, uh, whether it's kind of intended to be or not. And obviously, you know, writing, expression, and all of that. And uh, I want to get your thoughts on on what I on what I, I take from this. Uh, this this. Uh, the expression that comes from your work, uh, be it, you know, uh, coded in however way, um, in relation to this sense of belonging. Now, I have found through my perception that uh, we don't, our, our natural habitat is around other people. And when I myself feel like I belong, it's because I'm surrounded by people who make me feel part of them. Uh, when I don't feel like I belong, it's because of how I relate to the people around me, or rather don't relate. Um, now, tying that all together, and this whole thing with the status quo, and really speaking what you believe. Um, how, how, do you, how do you find that? Do you find a link between them? And how does that come about in your writing and just the way you live, really? Uh, can you just repeat the last part? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, self-expression, relation to belonging, relation to obviously the political things because you have values and beliefs. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you find that leads you in your life and what? you know, obstacles do you come across? Um. Okay, uh, but uh, you are asking about uh, in my life, not elsewhere. Yeah, uh, in uh, my life, not in what I, uh, in my work, what I write, right? They overlap. Okay. Um, uh, to be honest, really honest about it, uh, uh, such questions like uh, really in uh, uh, in that way, like uh, belonging or not, or how to uh, how could I support like the values I really want to support? Uh, it's not always a topic, especially the first part. Like we have something else about the political. I will, I will go for it. Uh, but this sense of belonging or not belonging, uh, especially in the situation we we are living in nowadays, it's not. Uh, uh, every time it's not an easy idea to even think about it because uh, sometimes uh, when uh, if you uh, if I would surrender myself really to think about to think 
like what I'm doing here. Uh, why I'm not doing like, for example, something else uh, that is more useful, or why can I uh, cannot uh, uh, I can't be home uh, in this very important situation the country is living. <coughs> if I want to surrender myself to keep thinking about those topics and finding the answers, I would go crazy. Really, really, I go, I would go crazy. Uh, but. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, I really wish I have an answer, a certain answer, but I really don't for this. Uh, about uh, like supporting a political value that you want to support, which uh, all that we said, I very much relate to what Astrid said. Like I find it really necessary and uh, and also I should uh, explain this so it's uh, it doesn't sound that uh, uh, we were uh, I was saying that my work is apolitical or it does not deal with politics at all uh, but I uh, like find it necessary that when there is a need uh, that I do it first like also as you said like as a citizen so for example in Damascus when I th I thought there is a need when I went into demonstration in that situation, I did not went as a writer going with people. I just went as a citizen who believed that this is the right way to do this. Uh, also, like when, if I wrote articles and so about uh, the political situation, uh, also, yeah, I do it, but it's not directly with literature. I'm sorry for my long, boring answer. No, 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 I sorry. hope it was. Thank you. So let me come back to, to the question I, I had asked earlier. I'm also hearing the important distinction that the authors are making, and some people from the audience also, that it's one thing to say to have a piece of work that deals with some political issue, whether it is the broad root sense of politics, as she mentioned, or whether politics in terms of party politics. It's another thing to say we're using literature to make a political statement. This is what I hear, at least the distinction being, being, being made. I personally have a problem making this distinction, but this is, this is me. Just as I have a problem making a distinction between myself as a writer, myself as a teacher, myself as a parent, myself as a lover, myself as a citizen. For me, those all are all things that make me as a citizen, but be as it may. Let's come to the question I had asked you, okay? Are there any particular controversial issues that you have dealt with in your writing? And I know you have. Um, and may you please give us a couple of concrete examples. And you may briefly want to say, how in your work you dealt with this controversial issue? I know it's a, it's, it's a large question, but if we could give the audience some examples, then you are concretizing your own perspectives on this topic. Okay, um, Yolanda. Yes, I, I voy a leer la respuesta. Bueno, el tema controversial ya vimos que es el tema político y está en algunos de mis últimos libros. Los ejemplos. Voy a leer un pequeño párrafo. En el año 2001 tuve una visión que me alertó acerca de lo que vendría. En el centro de la autopista que cruza el valle de Caracas de este a oeste hay una escultura que representa a una deidad nativa María Leonza se llama. Un amigo poeta, Santos López, me hizo ver que la diosa, montada sobre un tapir americano, carga en alto un hueso pélvico. Yo no soy religiosa, ni sigo el culto de María Leonza, but... ¿Puedes seguir leyendo? Directamente. <risa> Sí, para no, para no, no pero voy a traducir lo que dijiste y no. luego sigo. Sí, y sigue, y sigue. Okay. Sí. So, um, Antoine Valer. <laughs> okay, so the first of two examples of the political in um, Yolanda's work. So in 2001, Yolanda had a vision. 
which alerted her to what was to come. So there's a highway that crosses the valley of Caracas from east to west. And in the middle of this highway, there's a sculpture which represents a native deity called Maria Leonza. Um, it's a goddess mounted on an American tapir, and she's holding up a pelvis. And this was pointed out to her by uh, a poet friend of hers called Santos Lopez. Um, Yolanda is not religious. She doesn't follow the cult of Maria Leonza, but in the poem, a poem called El Hueso Pelvico, Pelvis, a book-length poem, uh, she invokes Maria Leonza as a symbol of maternal protection in the face of an inevitable confrontation. So her vision was one of a historical tragedy. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, uh, so the second example so would, is very different because we Venezuelans, we are prisoners of our political circumstance but she deliberately chose to look the other way. So thinking about the journey of life as a children's story allowed her to put all of the mixed up chapters in order. She could have ordered them around a tragic core or a drama, a comedy, a satire, but she was seduced by the idea of narration. And this finding resonated within her like an inner truth. And so the pieces that had become scattered and were still meaningless, began to fit. So this piece of work is called Bellas Ficciones, Fine Fictions. It's a book of poems that came out in 2016. So Yolanda's response to controversial issues of Venezuela was to affirm herself in lyric form. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Yolanda. And of course, Antoinette as well. Um, Russia, you want to t you want to tackle this question? Well, uh, um, actually, not sure because uh, when uh, uh, sometimes if I if you want to speak about your own work mm -hmm. and say about how your own work challenged something, uh, for me I don't because uh, it's. If it will sound like I'm saying like, oh, I'm so brave, I did this and this, and uh, you don't know how really your work challenged something. But I will uh, like simply say how uh, like every environment I was in evoked like uh, some topics, and maybe they were challenging. For example, I remember when I was, I published my first book, I was 24 years old. I don't know why they let me publish. I was really young and it was, the first thing, you know, that you, you are never happy with. Poetry. Uh, short stories. Short stories, okay. So in that age, like uh, as a woman in my 20s, for example, uh, like, yeah, it had uh, some topics dealing with, uh, for example, political, uh, political oppressions because some part of the stories were s uh, stories of people I knew who were like uh, arrested, who were in jail, and it's uh, speaking about uh, their lives a little bit. But the most important uh, is because I, uh, the society around is kind of conservative. So I remember when in, in that age I wanted to write really sexual content, brave content that uh, you know, dealing with sexuality, and uh, uh, it sounded obscene, really. And I like it at that age. Now, for example, nowadays, where uh, this this topic, it's not really a threat. No, no I'm, uh, I know, like the problems are still on, but it's not really the main topic of focus. Uh, I I don't feel, for example, the uh, the need now to write it that way. And uh, actually, it's now uh, the least topic I write, I write about and um, because I don't see the challenge anymore. There is nobody like to challenge with this. Uh, so uh, like it's, uh, it's other topics. For example, in Germany, it's in Germany all what you hear all the time. It is about like uh, the migration crisis, the refugee crisis. It's the, the only thing everybody talked about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people write their like uh, diaries, like dealing with this. 
so I chose to write, but from the other uh, hand, like I chose to write something, a book. It's called How German Grammar Was Invited, uh, inv uh, Invented. It's not about me, my diaries. It's about how I see myself also. Uh, like, for example, a German culture, but it's a humorous book. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like it's a friendly kind of trying to uh, change the roles in this, you know? So I don't know if, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So in terms of how you dealt with them in the first case, the early book, yeah. It was right in your face, and okay. Yeah. And then the second one, you're using possibly uh, humor, satire, humor, yeah. and yeah. you're being critical through the humor itself. Yeah. And of course, humor is a form of tragedy, also. It it is. Okay. It is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Astrid, sorry. Um, so, perhaps in contrast to Russia and um, Yolanda, I um, operate in an environment that at least to on the surface seems very free. However, um, I have felt creeping in, certainly over the past couple of years, a tightening grip, the tightening grip of encouraged self-censorship. And I'd be really interested to hear how your thoughts, what your thoughts are on this topic. To give you an example, I had a po the poem, the title has changed, but for very diff different reasons than the one I'm going to give you. And I had sent this to be published in a uh, journal. And I received an email from the editor. The title of the poem was, And God Became a Monkey. And the editor wrote to me, just asking, say, just saying, could I think about this? Because it was offensive. <laughs> I was offending people who, um, I don't I believe in God, who are Christians. And, and, and well, in my, what I, my response was that people are very lucky that I'm saying um, that God became a monkey, because had I been Nietzsche, of course, God would have been dead. So. It's, but it was a strange moment, and, and it's where I thought this, I didn't expect it. I had no idea that this could be in any way offensive. There is another, um, I've had other comments, for instance, um, am I going on too long? No, 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 I mean, the follow-up question was, how has um, the audience or the public accepted your work? And you're, you're giving us an example of that as well. That's fine. Go ahead. And another um, instance is um, the, uh, the, how readers, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm curious to hear what pe other people think and, and on that kind of response that I'm sure some of you will have had mm -hmm. to your work. And are we slowly in the West sliding into more and more self-censorship, self-erosion? Are we capitulating to a new status quo mm -hmm. in which governmental institutions are slowly turning into uh, us into environmentalists, health carers, edu educationalists? So are we slowly having to fill in the gaps where the government is letting us down. And in the process of doing that, because we need the money, mm -hmm. are we beginning to capitulate to that and are we starting on a very scary, slippery slope of self-censorship? And I'd love to hear your thoughts and don't shoot me down over right. this. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Leanne has just reminded me we've been going on for an hour and a half. So I promise that I will conclude in two seconds. Five minutes. So be quick. <laughs> More teas, two seconds is five minutes. Sorry. Okay. So um, before I will ask any of the authors to make any final whatever question, you may want to read two or three lines from something. I know we're going to hear you read later on in the festival. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be here. I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, but I will really miss it. So. Um, 
Any from the audience have any burning comments to make? Yes. Leanne, don't waste time, please. <laughs> I know Leanne well, I can. All right, cool. So we're back online. Um, yeah, I love this whole thing about the censorship. Um, I feel it a great deal, and I think that many, sec uh, men many parts of uh, all the communities um, that I've seen so far, at least, are participating in this. Um, you know, I mean, uh, some of you may look at me and call me a hippie or a hipster or any of that, and um, I do partly, I, do, I did partly identify with that, and a lot of that is built upon this whole uh, bad vibes are not a good thing, uh, and obviously censoring your bad vibes is, well, it's certainly not going <laughs> to do any good. Um, yeah, we're being turned into environmentalists. Um, uh, we're all very passionate about things, and passion is so easy to manipulate and to channel. Um, and yeah, I think I think you're spot on. And yeah, that's a, a bloody slippery slope, in it. Yeah. Okay. So it's a comment. Thank yeah, it was a comment. Okay. Fair Anyone else? before I will be accused of censoring guests there. Um, here at Malta, self-censorship works really well considering that person you're offending is most probably about three, de three degrees of separation from either your employer or your greengrocer or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, and in fact, in, in, that, in that situation, I think one, it might choke down literature to that end, but at the same time, given the, the current rise in, in protests and things like that, it's almost as if uh, people would, prefer, would rather find their voice in, in groups than would be finding their voice, uh, than projecting their own voice in the form of literature. The, the other escape is pseudonyms going on, even uh, going on the internet with sock puppet accounts and, and things like that. That's, but, but it's nice to hear that at least you're on a slippery slope. Okay. Thank you. Another comment. So I'm going to ask the authors, any final thoughts? It doesn't have to be conclusions, but anything else you want us to, to end this session with? Yolanda? No? Yes, go ahead. Sí, bueno, quiero, quiero dejar como un comentario final eh, lo, que, lo que pienso acerca de la poesía escrita, porque es diferente. I don't understand. El, ah, ah, excuse me. <laughs> 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 Digamos que, que yo defiendo, aceptando los otros lenguajes, el lenguaje visual, defiendo la, la, la poesía escrita y acepto lo arcaico del oficio en un mundo de imágenes, saturado por las imágenes. En ese sentido, en un momento de quiebre de la humanidad y con la, el, el planeta amenazado de ser destruido, yo veo a los poetas, a los poetas que escriben en el papel con un lápiz, que son muy pocos, En una, dentro de una cueva, eso lo decía el poeta uruguayo Eduardo Milán, iluminados por, el, pequeña, por una pequeña vela y dejando por escrito sus pensamientos. Ese es mi comentario final. La defensa de la, de la, del papel, de la poesía escrita, en un contexto absolutamente amenazante en todo sentido. Thank you. Okay. Antoine? Yeah, so Yolanda's final comment is a defense of written poetry, of um, poetry written on paper, um, kind of as a resistance to the very negative and, and, and increasingly dangerous context 
that, that, that surrounds it. At the same time, she accepts the archaic nature of the profession of poetry and um, the role that poetry has always played in, um, uh, in resisting. Thank you. She wants to add something else? Because she also, because she described this image of uh, uh, poets writing in caves, with, with um, illuminated by a, with a candle. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Russia, Astrid, whoever wants to go next. Mm, no, actually, I don't. Mm, uh, as you said, it's hard really to get a conclusion. No, I All don't mean a conclusion. Yeah, a, a but point. I really want to thank you for the questions. And uh, even like if we are, uh, for me, I'm still like uh, lost and confused in many of the parts we discussed here. Mm -hmm. It's not we may not have the answers, but at least it's. Um, we like the, the, the chance to like provoke this idea okay. like each okay. time, so it was a nice chance to do this. Thank you. Astrid? Yes, I'd also like to um, thank Yolanda and, and, and Russia and, um, for being on this panel. And, um, that's it. That's it.